What's up? It's episode 125, Pain Points of Wealth, and Apple now is at $3 trillion as the stock market continues to heat up. Economic data continue to come in better than expected. The Roaring Twenties, we've been talking about it. They're here. So we're going to talk about the momentum the market has, what we see in the economy, like we do every week, and some of the bigger signals that things are going to get even better than they are today. So we're going to talk about that on the tipping point today. We're going to talk about cyber fraud. We've got our friend Keith Tesler on today telling you how you protect yourself against one of the biggest issues in America today, money being stolen from your account. We got a great episode and we have our colleague Frankie Lagrateria on talking everything financial planning. Check it out. We got a great show. Guys, you know, week after week, all I hear about from these strategists is the black swan event that's going to bring the market down, you know, cause a deep recession, cause a bear market. But you know what's really been going on? White swan events, right? It's in plain sight. We just had the GDP revised for the first quarter, significantly higher. Earnings came in significantly better in the first quarter, right? The stock market's doing way better than anybody anticipated in the first half, except for us, of course. Um, everybody out there was looking for a down first half, up second half. I wonder what they're going to do now. <laughs> We're going to have to change their tune and pretend they didn't say what they said before. That's typically what happens. <laughs> um, like, you know, I was always optimistic about things. It's amazing, too, though. Like, the market needs to go up, like, 25% before anyone changes their tune, right? Which, it, invariably, it's too late. <laughs> you know, like, it's not helpful after the fact. But, like, you know, every metric we're looking at right now just looks great, right? We saw jobless claims come in. Uh, you know, relatively low this past week. Uh, we had the PCE, which is like the Fed's favorite inflation gauge. I don't know why, but that came in lower than expected, meaning inflation is coming down faster than it's been anticipated. And earnings look like right now they're going to start getting a lot better going into next year. And if you really want to look, start looking out further, a lot of the strategists we follow think earnings could be good in 2025. So, you know, we're, we're really complete opposite of what everyone was anticipating. It's just remarkable uh, how that actually transpires. Yeah, you know, I was uh, talking to a client of mine yesterday. We were going through and doing their annual review, going through performance and everything. And they just couldn't believe uh, how well they're doing this so far this year. They, they, they kept saying to me, Chris, I thought we were in a recession. I thought we were going to lose money again this year. So the surprises are definitely coming in the positive. Well, that's the whole point, Chris. I mean, now, as you, as you look, at, look back over the last six months, the consensus opinion was we're going to have a recession because we had an inverted yield curve. Uh, we're going to have a profits recession. You know, that was pretty much baked in the cake. You know, that was consensus opinion. You look at all the hedge funds and institutional managers. They were more short the S&P 500 in futures and, and options uh, and indexes, you know, than uh, probably since 2007. So, you know, clearly the market always does what it has to do to confound the majority opinion of the day as I've said so many times in the past. So, but the thing is, it's not easy. It's, you know, just because we were optimistic didn't mean we knew. You can't predict the future. There's, it's so complex. There's, there's so many countervailing forces, um, but there's always opportunity. And it, and it just goes to show you the only people that benefit from bear markets like last year and then a bull market this year are people that stay fully invested in the strategy based on their goals. Well, you know what, that it's okay that the hedge funds are, are out of the market. I mean, they, they didn't anticipate this. I mean, the S&P is only up like 14%, you know, just a small amount. <laughs> well, it's like amazing. Just a about small amount. Yeah, Bob and I have been saying this, like the hedge funds only outperformed when they were able to get information illegally. <laughs> so conveniently, after the financial crisis, it wasn't so hard. It was harder for them to trade illegally. So now all of a sudden their performance isn't as good. So having illegal inside information is very helpful to beat the market. But for all of us that want to stay in the confines of the law... Uh, very hard to do that. You know, and it's also interesting, too. I mean, you know, we talk about like just the real economy and what you hear on the media. And it's like, let's face it, for the last two years, what have we seen? Help wanted signs in every restaurant that you walk into. You know, people can't find labor. Like every business owner we talk to, it's not that there's not business to do. They can't find workers to do the business, right? Um, you go to the airport, it's just jamming right now. There's like 2.2 million people going through those TSA lines every single day. 
And I think that's the thing is like the, the economy has been telling you, you know, in plain sight, like, hey, things aren't that bad. A recession isn't when you have, you know, a labor shortage, when, you, when you're looking for workers like that's And people are traveling all the time. Like that doesn't jive. <laughs> you know, you're going to recession when that's what's happening in the real economy. Well, you know, you have the big 4th of July weekend coming up as we're recording this. Um, and all the reports have been, you know, the travel's been a nightmare. There are 800 canceled flights. Chris, you had a tough time, you know, coming back from Atlanta because of flight delays and and uh, just overcrowding. Uh, and the government says, well, those darn airlines are overbooking. What do you mean they're overbooking? It means there's gigantic demand. The problem is they don't have enough airline hostesses. They don't have enough people, you know, air traffic controllers. You know, there's a lack of employers, employees, right, uh, to fill these spots. And the economy could be even, you know, more robust if we were able to, you know, get the people to work in these jobs, these job openings. We have, um, what, 10 million, 11 million job openings right now? You know, as yeah. a matter of fact, one of the clients that uh, I met with down in Atlanta, he's a former Delta Airlines mechanic, and his phone is ringing off the hook. He's 74 years old. His phone's ringing off the hook to get him to come back to work just to get these planes back up and running. He says, it's yeah, Chris, I was, I was driving out the coming back from um, uh, Pennsylvania yesterday and listening to the news and they were, United was offering their steward and stewardesses triple overtime, you know, triple their, their base salary, you yeah. know, to work this weekend. I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah. And then, you know, just fuel to the fire. We talked about this last week. We're on the cusp of a manufacturing boom, right? There's $2 trillion worth of uh, bills that were passed through Congress that are going to basically incentivize onshoring, um, you know, the manufacturing of electric vehicles here, solar equipment, semiconductors, so and, and infrastructure like highways, right? All that stuff is going to be getting refurbished over the course of the next couple of years, which is going to be a tremendous amount of jobs. We've already seen construction manufacturing is like going through the charts, uh, off the charts. So we're like, we're going to actually have an old fashioned manufacturing boom, you know, forget going to recession, we're going to have a we're going to have a roaring boom here in the 20s. I mean, it's going to be absolutely phenomenal and no one's talking about it. Yeah, well, that's been the big thing, right? Everybody's been looking for this recession. We just say the other day, right? It's like waiting for Godot never shows up. Um, it's actually the you know, market's actually been an expansion, right? We're actually growing the economy. Um, but it cracks me up. You know, I, I heard you make your case the other day for onshoring and reshoring and a manufacturing boom. And then like 10 minutes later, I literally heard a perma bear say, yeah, but yeah, sure, they're, they're going to build all this stuff. But who says there's going to be demand for all the products yeah, they create? Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, the fact that like every automotive uh, company has changed their business model to basically producing more electric vehicles in the future says that's where the future is going to be. And I'm sure, you know, they're not just making a, uh, a bet on a whim there. And, you know, Dad, going back to what you said about where's the demand going to come from? I was talking to a client of mine just this past week. He bought a new truck for his wife. And he was surprised to find out that that truck will actually be here early when it comes in in August. So mm. there's plenty of demand for things like vehicles, but you just can't get them. Well, as you know, <clears throat> I'm saying earlier, Chris, uh, you know, Ferrari uh, just announced their new lineup. And it's three and a half years if you order a new car today. Wow. Three and a half years for a new Ferrari. I mean, it's That's just, incredible. And, and they have a new SUV and they said, forget about it. You're not even going to get one. Um, no, I think you know, if we, put our, we pull our money together collectively, we can afford a bumper. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> This is true. I'm not promoting Ferraris. I'm just telling you that there's huge demand uh, for all types of products out there right now. I don't know, but I don't think you're, you're sure enough to get in one of those Ferraris. So it's, uh, you know, it's not made for your, your body type. But, you know, the, the other thing that's remarkable, too, is, you know, we've talked about this broadening out of the rally, right? It's not just tech anymore. This month, we've seen huge moves in consumer discretionary. It's up like 8%. Material stocks are up over 8%. You know, financials are starting to move. They're up 5% this month. So, you know, money is definitely moving elsewhere. It's not just tech and tech gets all the spotlight here. And you know, this one of our thesis is and one of our viewpoints is like spread your money out, right? You don't want to be concentrated in what's been the hottest place to be this year. It's just co good common sense. And you are starting to see other sectors, other parts of the economy. Uh, other stocks are really starting to move. And you want to make sure you have money there as well. You know, just don't follow the leader here. And I think that's a mistake a lot of investors are going to make. They're just going to follow what's been hot. Yeah, I agree with that, Ryan. I mean, I definitely have a diversification, or as we like to call it, whenever you brush your teeth, good breath. You know, I'm speaking to a prospect right now um, who's been out talking to our competition about how to invest their money. And, and I'm not saying everybody's lazy out there, but boy, oh boy, these, <laughs> these proposals are pretty ridiculous. Um, I recommend, hey, put some money in a large cap growth portfolio, put some money in a large cap value portfolio and buy a couple of bonds and you're set. 
Um, and then they sit down and they go through the diversification strategy to show them how they should own all these different asset classes, but then they don't recommend anything, anything other than what's up already. So I think, you know, when it comes to your portfolio, make sure your portfolio is based on you achieving your goals and your dreams. And you work backwards from that, from that goal. And the only way to reduce risk is to diversify the living daylights out of it. And that's not owning one index or one stock. That's owning lots of stocks and lots of indexes. So be careful out there. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 125, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially literally at any stage of your journey. This is what Bob, Chris, and I have done for a collective 75 years. But if you want a more hands-on approach, you want to get an idea of where you are right now, an assessment, if you saved over a million dollars, we'll run for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We'll build you your own personalized financial portal. We'll get a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address. Whether it's an income plan, how to live off your portfolio, how to take Social Security. Well, guess what? There's a lot of ways to take Social Security. Only one right way for you. We're going to give you a full dynamic income plan, factor in inflation so you don't run out of money. We're going to look at diversification. Has your portfolio been all over the place the last year and a half as markets have been extremely volatile? Or have you been sitting with way too much money in cash? Paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out what to do. We're going to put together a full investment game plan, show you how to grow your money, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we're going to look at fees and taxes. Wall Street just loves to sell you those high-cost, tax-inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, insurance product, brokerage product. We're going to do a deep dive of every investment you own, break down all the internal costs, show you how to reduce the cost on your portfolio, and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. We're going to give you our full tax playbook. Literally go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And we got a very special guest on our show today. We've got Keith Tesler. He's the CEO of IT Solutions of the main line. Uh, that's CMIT, IT Solutions. We're actually a client of his. He does all our IT work here at Pain Capital Management. Uh, entrepreneur, grew up in an entrepreneurial business, works with a lot of entrepreneurial clients, small businesses like ours. And you know, one of the bigger trends that we're seeing right now as wealth advisors is cyber fraud has become rampant. In fact, the FBI reported something like 10.3 billion last year lost in cyber fraud. So Keith, awesome to have you on the show. Um, love to get your perspective and with your business and what you see on the IT side, like what are some of the bigger issues or the bigger scams trends that are going on right now in cybersecurity or cyber, cyber hacking rather? Thanks for having me, Ryan. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing what's happened. Spam, which is traditionally be considered kind of a nuisance, has become a, a real threat, I'm sorry to say. What you see is these phishing emails where people send you an email that looks like Microsoft or looks like PayPal or something like that. They use that to get your password and get into your email account. And once they get into your email account, they're not just using it to send spam emails anymore. They're using it to read all your emails, learn everything about you, and then use that information to institute real significant financial crimes. One of their favorite tasks, frankly, is to figure out who your financial advisor is because they can read your emails. They understand your writing style because they've read all your emails and then send your financial advisor an email saying, please transfer, I don't know, $10,000 to some account that they own. Yeah, you know, That's Keith, good. I've been seeing this a lot over, over the last couple of years. And you know, one of the things that scammers, they always ask for an odd amount, which is a big red flag for us. But um, fortunately, I, I don't think it's just paying capital, but I think the industry has a standard where you actually have to speak to someone, you know, before we can initiate a transfer. But now I'm reading that AI could duplicate, you know, Keith Tesler's voice. And so when I call and say, hey, Keith, that $9,500 you want, uh, is AI going to be able to tell me that, uh, that you're authorizing that? Uh, not yet, but they're getting closer and closer. Today, um, they still can, they can mimic a voice, but they can't do it in real time and they can't do a conversation yet. Okay. Uh, but be careful, watch out for voicemails because they totally can do it there. 
Yeah, one thing, you know, Keith, you came in and you did training for us, I guess, uh, I guess it was last year. And, you know, one of the things that we really focused on was that this whole aspect of social engineering, you know, what these some of these fraudsters are doing uh, from a social engineering standpoint. You talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So it's not just a matter of getting into your email account. They use the information they learned, not only to attack you, but attack your friends and relatives. So they'll read the emails. They may figure out who you're doing business with. Uh, you know, who your accountant is, who your friends are, and then they'll use that as a jumping off point to get into their accounts. They'll send them emails in your name, real legitimate emails. Remember, they're in your email account and use that to get into their accounts and then work account to account to continue to infect your friends and family. You know, I get a lot of uh, texts now that my Wells Fargo account has a problem. Of course, I don't have a Wells Fargo account. Uh, is this a new strategy that they're using? Yeah, they're not just doing email anymore. They've taken to using texting and even phone calls. Um, I've encountered people who have been stuck on the phone with Comcast or Verizon, and it wasn't Comcast or Verizon. They're just pretending to be these organizations and attempt to extract information from you. I'm having an issue with uh, Comcast right now. As a matter of fact, you know, your company's here working on my internet as we're doing this podcast. Um, I can't get Comcast to answer the phone or come see me. So I, they don't really reach out to you, do they? I mean, none of these companies can actually reach <laughs> no, out. No, and that's definitely one of the red flags. If someone calls from you and says they're from Comcast or from Verizon or even your bank, Wells Fargo, be very suspicious of that call. My advice is find out, get a number, an ID number or something, hang up and call a number that you know is valid for that organization. There's almost no valid reason why these people will be calling you on the phone. Especially the IRS or Social Security, right? They, they don't reach out to you. They never reach, by the way, the IRS initially never uses email to reach out to you. They always send stuff in the mail. Um, be very, very cautious of those sorts of things. That's a more likelihood fraud. Keith, uh, is there, is there any particular demographic or, or group that these, that these people target? Yeah. Unfortunately, they tend to attack older, wealthier Americans. Um, they tend to be more susceptible fraud, frankly, a little less tech savvy, um, and a little bit easier targets. But don't think just because you're a millennial or safe. I've seen millennials, uh, scammed out of tens of thousands of dollars. Wow. And, and like, what kind of things can people look out for? Like, especially, you know, we have a, you know, we have a, the demographic of, in our client group base that you're talking about. I mean, what kind of things should be people be looking out for? What can they do? Yeah. When you get a communication, there's a few key points that you should look for. One, is it expected? If you get something out of the blue, that's the first indication that something is questionable. You know, if you're not expecting to get an email or a text from someone, question it. Number two is, is it asking for urgency? Most things in life aren't urgency, but the scammers tend to say, act now, move right away. We need this urgently or you'll be locked out of your account. If you see urgency, that's another thing you should watch out for. Um, and the third thing you should watch out for is look at it. Does it look legitimate? Check the email address. Is it actually from the email it says it should be from? Do the links go to the websites they say they go to? You know, if you click a link, does it go where it should? Um, those are the kind of things you do. Inspect the message, see if it looks reasonable. And like you guys do, which is absolutely best practice, if you have a question, pick up the phone, talk to the person live. Yeah, that's a good point. And I mean, we we get a lot of this. I mean, I'm, I'm, I probably get an email, even from my employees, like someone will be posing as Frankie um, saying, hey, you know, I've changed my account information. Can you change where my paycheck goes? Um, and the email always comes from this weird address. But I get those all the time. And of course, I changed all the information I've been sending to somebody else. And I don't think Frankie's got paid now for a month. So she won't talk to yeah, me. Yeah, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. I don't know if I'm paid anymore. not why you're doing the podcast from a cave this morning, but... <laughs> Live. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if Frankie, I don't know what you've seen, but like I had this one client. I mean, they mimicked my clients, the cadence of the way they would send an email to me perfectly. Had I not called them, um, like Frank, what what fraud have you seen with your clients? Have you come across anyone trying to dupe you into sending money elsewhere? You know, everyone's always trying to be Frankie until, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I get it. Um, actually, a, a funny one, uh, it wasn't funny in the moment, but someone had hacked into my boyfriend's family and his, his name's Morgan, which, you know, is typically a female name, you know, Frankie and Morgan. Um, and they called and they were asking for their, their daughter's information. So they were lazy hackers <laughs> and they're like, we don't, we don't have a daughter. We have a six foot three son. <laughs> um, so, so luckily they were, they were smart enough to catch that. And also, you know, the, the hackers were dumb enough to, uh, to kind of misgender him there. Hmm. You know, something else to watch out for is, and people don't think about it is gift cards. Gift cards are basically an untraceable form of money. If anything ever asks you for gift cards, 
be wary. I've seen a couple of scams. One, an employee got a text purportedly from the CEO. It wasn't saying, I need gift cards. It's urgent. I'm speaking and I need gift cards to give out as prizes. Send them here. They sent a few tens of thousand dollars in the wrong direction. Um, I know someone who got an email scam that said, um, someone in our congregation is in a hard time. Send them gift cards. It wasn't someone in the congregation and it wasn't the clergy. Ryan, whenever he wants to do any illegal transactions, he always uses Bitcoin. So, you know, Ryan, maybe yeah. you start using gift cards. Well, you know, and I li I'm listening to your podcast and I know how much you guys love Bitcoin and I mean that in all sarcasm, <laughs> but you know, Bitcoin is the, really the reason all this exists. The whole reason these people are able to get paid is because Bitcoin exists to create a anonymous form of money transfer that they can use to get paid on so many of these scams. So how, how does that work? That's actually interesting because I never could figure that out. Like, let's say that I get a fraudulent email to wire money somewhere, right? So I wire it to this and I, Bob, I think you had a client recently that, that, you know, had a large sum come out of their account. Um, you're presumably you're wiring it to a, a traditional bank, or you're not wiring to a traditional bank. Like, how does that work, and why is it non-traceable? Maybe you can walk us through that because that's something that I find. Like, sure. I never really so understood. the key. No, it's a good question. So you know, there's the whole um, know your um, know your um, client thing in banking, and the reason that exists is because of fraudulent bank accounts. In order to set up those bank accounts, it begins with identity theft of someone. So they can establish an identity in, in someone's name that they don't actually own that's not traceable to them. So okay. they set up a fraudulent bank account. Then what they'll do is after you wire the money to the bank account, they'll transfer it to Bitcoin so that no one can follow the trail from the Bitcoin to wherever the actual end recipient of the money is. Gotcha. Wow. Okay. So essentially it goes to a regular bank account at a, at a regular bank. Someone used some fraud to set up that account, but immediately it gets transferred out of that bank into Bitcoin. And from that point on, it's not traceable anymore. You got it. Yeah. What's happening with those banks now? Those, you know, is anything happening to them for having these fraudulent accounts set up? You know, I don't know the answer to that. That's an interesting question. Is I know they're really locked down on the rules of setting up bank account. That's why it's so hard to set up a bank account today. But as you can tell, they're still getting through it. Yeah, Keith, I have a, <clears throat> a very good friend and an elderly, elderly um, just got taken advantage of on his bank account locally down in Naples. Um, but, you know, he gave him all the information uh, he didn't know. You know, it's just he's not tech savvy. And, um, you know, fortunately, he was smart enough to tell me when it happened. So we locked down all of his accounts at, you know, at paying capital. Um, and it just it goes to show you like that, you know, they're, they're using the Internet. A lot of a lot of elderly people are using the Internet. They don't really understand. It. They don't have the patience. And if somebody's offering to help, they think that, oh, yeah, great. Help me out. <clears throat> but it never occurred to him. You know, when he was talking to somebody at Apple, that suddenly they could transfer him over to his representative at Wells Fargo. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. But it's just, again, yeah. as you get older, you know, you, you just don't, you, you know, you're you're just not as savvy. Um, and you just want the convenience of it getting done, right? So you could probably go out and play golf or pickleball or something. But what was the, probably what was, pickleball. What yeah. was the scam, Bob? Maybe you could, how did it actually transpire? I think, uh, I think initially uh, he got an email from Apple telling that his phone had been hacked. Um, and then, uh, you know, that they were going to transfer money out of his Wells Fargo accounts. So we better check that. So I guess why they, they actually did hack his email. So they knew he had an account at Wells Fargo. Mm, yes. Um, and, uh, you know, so, I mean, they, obviously they, they, they can't get anything out of fidelity cause they got to come through us or, you know, through paying capital. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, he just, he, 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 you know, in hindsight, he says, I, I don't know how I could have been that dumb, but he said, it just, you know, it seemed like. Like you said, Keith, it was the urgency, you know, get this done before they get all your money. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, I mean, great, great for him, you know, because I'm, I consolidate everything. One of the things that we, we believe is, you know, making sure that everything's custodied with us so we can balance everything properly. So all he had in the checking account was his monthly distributions from us. Um, so it could have been worse, right? And, um, but then I find out, you know, he had a cowboy account. Uh, with uh, twenty thousand in crypto, and they got that. So <laughs> wow, you know, you know, fortunately, everything, all his big money was protected because it was with us. But you know, you're so vulnerable, and he learned a lesson. I think that's why we want to do this call. We want all of our clients to realize that somebody's reaching out to you. You know, don't don't react. You know, get to the people that you know. Don't just react to email or text or these robo calls. Gary in New York um, just sent me an article. I think he sent it to you guys as well. Uh, this woman just got taken for 350,000 on social security fraud. Um, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it, 
we should actually send that article out to our clients, you know, because you're thinking, how could somebody be that dumb? But, you know, you don't know. And you're in that situation, you know, you're trying to protect yourself. And again, they create that sense of urgency and they sound, you know, like they are an authority. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's really scary. And it just ticks me off that they're taking advantage of the elderly. You know, you hear about elderly abuse. It's real. It's huge. And it's getting worse. You know, and one thing I'll say is, is old, good old fashioned county controls make a huge difference as well. You know, we had, we recently um, onboarded a client who had literally had someone in their email for over a year that they didn't know about. And that person had generated a fake employee that they were paying every week along with their regular payroll and they didn't know. And good basic accounting controls would have told them that. So, you know, balance your checkbook, look at your transactions, good old fashioned stuff still applies in the modern world. Ryan, Hank, um, that, that's a normal employee. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't Hank, worry is, about Hank. Hank is Frankie's dog, just so everyone knows. Um, I noticed he had a fur coat on last time he came into the office. But, <laughs> no, it, the, the, it's a great point. Um, you know, I think one thing we get away from now, because everything's just like auto debit, right? Like it, everything's on autopilot. It's not like back in the day where you bounce your checkbook. And actually my accountant, one piece of advice he gave me when I started my business was he said, you and only you should go through every transaction every month for your business. Because he's like, he had just had a litany of stories of, of fraud within the business of people stealing from the business, um, not following those transactions. Um, but that, that's a great point. Like just taking the time each month, review your credit card statements. If you're still writing checks, review those checks that are actually written from your account. Um, but that's that's right. It's like a very simple, common sense thing that we don't do anymore. Chris and I did it last month. We saw a lot of charges in Monaco, didn't we, Chris? Yeah, we sure did. Yeah. <laughs> that's all right. The FBI is on it. That's called research. That <laughs> was um, research? Okay. Yeah. Just check it. It's deductible then. I like that. <laughs> um, yeah, just in regards to other things, you know, Keith, you can do like um, – with with protecting yourself are there are there other precautions that you recommend or like can you tell if someone's monitoring your email like are there are there other steps that you can take to be proactive when it comes to really protecting yourself from cyber fraud great question so the number one thing everyone's recommending today is setting up two-factor authentication everywhere um you know yeah. the banks today are requiring it if you don't have it on your personal email put it on um, it can go a long way to stopping someone from getting into your email, into all your accounts. I know nobody likes the extra step, but I got to tell you, it, it's a, it cuts out about 90% of the hackers. It'll stop right there. It's not 100%, but it does a good job of um, stopping people in their tracks. So that's one thing you can do real quick and easy to protect yourself. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I mean, is there any way to tell if someone's like hacking your accounts and been monitoring it? Is there is there like an overlay software? There's something you can do about that? Because it seems to me like that is becoming more common. And that's where the best scam I saw again was a client who someone had been probably monitoring their email for a long time, was able to send me an email in, a, in, a, in the language of my actual client from their email address, which is crazy. Yeah, and actually this is a place where AI can really help us. Um, today there are AI monitoring tools that will monitor your email account for you and look for the kinds of behaviors that hackers do. So one thing hackers will do is they'll get into your account and they'll put a bunch of uh, rules into your account so that they can send and receive email without you noticing. Um, and there's a certain wow. pattern to those rules. So the AI can pick up that. They'll also look for stuff like where you're logging in from. You know, if you log in from your home and then two seconds later log in from a Russia, China, you know, some country like that, well, then guess what? That's obviously of concern. So there's AI tools out there that'll monitor your accounts for you and um, alert you if it thinks something might be wrong. Maybe you just went on vacation. Maybe it's a problem. Keith, can you uh, recommend any any particular tools? Or is there something that you like? My favorite one for that is a tool called Barracuda Sentinel. It does exactly what you're talking about. Well, Keith, that's great information. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, just to give us some, you know, a, a view from where for your standing. You get to see a lot of the uh, the more fraudulent activity going on out there. Um, it's great having you on the show, and it's great information. This has been an awesome segment. Glad I could help. It was a lot of fun, actually. It was very easy. <laughs> you guys are you guys are actually, easy to chat with. Maybe, a... <laughs> and I can tell stories about this all day. I'm sorry to say, so it's easy. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> to, to end it off, what is what's like the the biggest fraud, or what's one of the most egregious things that you've seen uh, when it comes to fraud? The biggest fraud, I the big dollars wise, the biggest fraud I ever saw was a customer of mine. They um, they work they do they do manufacturing in China so there's you know, big manufacturing orders being going back and forth between them, 
they hacked into actually not their accounts, but their suppliers accounts. The supplier sent them an email totally looking legit using the proper form, everything else saying we need to redirect a wire transfer for $150,000. Um, the person actually did process the wire transfer at the last minute. Uh, the CFO noticed what was going on and made a phone call and realized it was fraud. Wow. So the money didn't go out. He was able to save it. The money before. never went out. They caught it before it went out. But as you can imagine, they put some serious procedures in place. And remember, this wasn't hacking that happened to them. This was their supplier. The email was in every way they could tell legitimate. Wow. That's wild. Um, crazy. And then one, actually one question we ask every guest. So yeah, uh, you get the question as well, Keith is if you could name one album that you, when you heard it the first time, it changed the way you viewed the world, essentially changed your life. What album would, would that be and why? Oh, easy one. Um, Billy Joel, uh, Glass Houses, and it was the first album I ever loved and it really taught me to love music and I've been a music lover ever since. Wow, favorite Billy Joel song? Actually, uh, not from that album, Stiletto, kind of obscure. Yeah, it's obscure. I don't think I even know the song. You guys know the song? I don't think you know any Billy Joel songs, right? You don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, because, that's because Ryan's not an uptown girl. <laughs> right. Not yet, Chris. Not yet. Well, where, have you seen Billy Joel live? Oh, yeah. Many times. Many, many. And actually, I think we're hopefully going to go this fall again. He's still performing, believe it or not. Isn't he doing like 10 shows, like completely sold out at Madison Square Garden or something like that? Like, I think it's some insane. That, yes, that's what we're trying to get into. We're trying to, that's what we're trying to go to. I hear they're still absolutely fantastic, though. Like, such a I've heard, I've got friends who went and they say he's still, the guy can still perform. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's still a performer and he's got to be in his 80s by now. Is he 80 now? Oh my God. I didn't he's realize probably, that. I think he's, yeah, he's, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, no, if you're, if you're selling at Madison Square Garden 10 nights in a row, you're probably still a pretty good performer. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 You can't just, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, whatever they call it, check in or whatever, check yeah, out. You can't phone that in. You can't yeah. phone it in. You can't That's phone right. it in. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Keith, yeah. man, thanks for having me on the show. This has been great. I will put all your information in the episode. We appreciate all you do for us at Payne Capital, uh, you know, servicing all our security needs. And that's just great information for our clients. Amazing, amazing segment. Hey, pleasure, guys. You have a good one. Take care. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Keith. All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, Toyota reports that it has developed a solid state battery that allows electric vehicles to drive more than 900 miles on one charge. That's much further than the 300 miles that many EVs on the road today powered by liquid lithium and cobalt batteries typically only driving on one charge. You know, it's like anything else, right? When you have um, any type of new technology or any commodity, for example, right? We've been talking about peak oil for years, and all of a sudden the, uh, the world discovered fracking, and, you know, we got all the oil we need. And I think the same thing's happening with electric vehicles. You know, you, you think about all the limitations. You know, you take, um, you know, North Philadelphia or West Philadelphia or South Philadelphia where you double park, you know, when you go home at night. You, you don't have a garage. There's nowhere to put a charging station. Yeah, what's going to happen to all those EVs, right, that are parked in South Philly? I, I don't think they got a shot. So you're going to need longer-lasting batteries, and it makes sense that that technology will evolve. So it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't even shock me. Well, no I think what they'll do is what Ryan did in college when he didn't pay his electric bill. He just ran an extension cord to the hallway into his apartment, <laughs> which is actually true. It was down to the basement. And that, funny enough, when I was in the, the south of France recently, we had one of these tiny Italian EVs and literally put it in the garage just plugged it right into the wall like you plug in your vacuum at night it's completely wild so you know it's coming and it's going to be that simple um i like it was literally like just like a, a normal outlet that they had in the garage just like you have in your house so and the thing could cruise you can see it go up hills it was unbelievable so we know chris loves italian cars so um he loves those designs <laughs> Actually, well, he, just, he just ordered his new ferrari he didn't know it's going to take three and a half years to get <laughs> It's nice. Amazing. I was able to purchase. I was able to purchase one wheel. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice being the rich brother, Frankie. Some 2.2 million people moved to the southeast in just over two years. That's roughly the population of Houston. A flood of transplants helped steer about 100 billion in new income to the southeast in 2020 and 2021 alone, while the northeast bled out something like 60 billion, based on analysis recently published in the Internal Revenue Service data. Man, oh man, it's like uh, the South is, is rising here. 
I am not surprised. So we have an office down in Jacksonville. I was just down there last week. And I would say over 50% of my clients there, they're, they're not Southern. They're just, they're just like, you know, Philadelphia, New York, New Jersey. They just relocated. I get it, you know. It's, you know, nicer weather. You know, the taxes help. So this doesn't surprise me in the least. It's becoming like a little, like, you know, little New Jersey, a little New York, a little Pennsylvania, all down in Florida. <laughs> yeah, with better weather and better taxes. So it makes sense. And you're right. I mean, we've been going to Jacksonville now for like over a decade, and it's just remarkable how much that city has changed. And you're right. It's, it's a lot of northeastern transplants. So um, and we know Bob is just stimulating the heck out of that uh, South Florida economy. Since Bob's moved in there, man, oh, man, it's like uh, they've never seen a spending uh, spree like that before. Uh, you know, Ry, I, gotta, <clears throat> I have all those Midwestern friends that I have to teach how to enjoy themselves. You know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. A lot of Midwesterners down there. Chris, in a new BBC Radio 4 interview, Paul McCartney says he has employed artificial intelligence to lift John Lennon's voice from an old demo tape, an achievement that was not possible using 1995 technology when the recording was first worked on. Well, I'll tell you what, technology really is incredible, but it just goes to show you my theory is correct. John Lennon is still very much alive. <laughs> nice. I think he's living in Africa, actually, with Jim Morrison. Who is that, uh, who's that comedian that played um, in Wayne's World? Not Mike Myers, but the other one who played Garth. Oh, Dana Carvey. He does an amazing John Lennon, so it may just be him. <laughs> you know, he's a master of disguise. <laughs> well, another great episode. Frank, thanks for joining us today. This is the 125th episode of Pain Points of Wealth. If you love our podcast, you like our podcast, you kind of like it, please give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Leave us a comment there. Tell us how great we are. We'd love that, too, if you like the podcast. If this is on YouTube right now, you can like this episode. You can subscribe to the channel. Click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. And you can subscribe on Spotify. That's this week's Pain Points of Wealth, episode 125. Stay loose and keep an open mind. <laughs>